Here in 1 Samuel chapter 29, as we continue through the life of Samuel, then Saul, now we're getting into David. I want to give you a topic for the sermon tonight. I would call it Choose Your Friends Wisely, but, but I think a better topic, a better title for this sermon would be Choose Your Enemies Wisely. We see here at this point where Saul and David have just been going at it back and forth. And when we get to chapter 29, something really unique happens. David is with the Philistines going to war against the Hebrews. He's going to fight against his brothers. It's almost like bizarro world, like things are upside down and backwards. It just doesn't make sense. How did we get to this point that David... A great man of God, one of the greatest kings we see in the Bible, is ready to go to war against his own blood brethren. How, how did it come to this point? If you notice what it says in verse number 8, 1 Samuel 29, verse 8, And David said unto Achish, But what have I done, and what hast thou found in thy servant, so long as I have been with thee in this day, that I may not go fight against the enemies of the Lord my King. He says, but what's wrong? I'm ready to go. I'm here to support you. I'm going to fight your enemies, King. Now the problem with this is his name is King Achish. He is the king of Gath. Now Gath, we first heard it of Goliath of Gath. The David that slew Goliath is now with his king, to go against his brethren, the Hebrews. Something's really wrong here. Yeah. I want to encourage you in this sermon not just to consider your friends, but also to consider your enemies. Uh, it's, I, I believe it's a biblical concept to have enemies. And God has given us enemies, and I want to help identify who our enemies should be and who they should not be. This really, I believe, was a test of King David. This was one of the last tests before his ascent to his own throne and his own kingdom. This was a test, and in a certain regard, I, I think he failed. We're going to see that David actually will hit rock bottom, probably one of the lowest points of his entire life. I, I think even lower than the issue with Absalom. David is with Gath against the Hebrews. And God's going to correct him for it. God's going to judge him. God's going to punish him. And he's going to learn an invaluable lesson about friendships and also enemieships, right? We all have enemies. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm speaking to the perfect crowd tonight. You guys are the ones that actually come on a Wednesday night. You're the perfect Christians, you have no enemies. Everyone in here is a peacemaker. We, we always do all things right. Well, not so fast. God has told us we have enemies. Now, we do have a problem in the flesh that sometimes we make enemies out of people we shouldn't. I get that. We're all guilty of that. These are some important lessons I want to talk about tonight. If you'll look in the next chapter with me, go to chapter 30. Go to chapter 30, and if you would, look at verse number 26. And when David came to Ziklag, he sent of the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. This is after David got it right, and he's trying to restore some friends. This is after David hit rock bottom, and he has learned his lesson. He's immediately trying to restore friendships and he's also recognizing who a righteous enemy is. It is the enemies of the Lord. If you would go to Genesis chapter 3 with me. Go to the very beginning. The first word, enemy, in the Bible. We want to look at that mention. And again, I, I want to help you with this to actually make some good enemies. Making good enemies, righteous enemies, the ones that you ought to be. And really, also, we ought to let go of the bondage of making pointless enemies. I think sometimes we make enemies out of people when we shouldn't. There's a lesson on both sides of the ledger. 
You say, who are my enemies? I would ask you that. I want you to ask yourself, who are my enemies? Who is supposed to be my adversary? Who are my true friends? Who are the ones that I can call about anything in a time of need and without judgment? Boy, they're going to help me. Who, who are those? Who should not be my friends? Very important question. And also, who should not be my enemies? That too is very important. We know we have the ability to be in the flesh. And so we have to take heed to our own spirit. This is as old as uh, any story in the Bible, really. We know that there are three types of people in the world. Right? There's the positive, the negative, and the neutral is the illustration I like to use. What are you talking about? I'm talking about uh, those that are saved. I'm talking about the reprobates. I'm talking about the lost. I'm talking about we have friends, and we have enemies, and we have acquaintances. There's some people I know really well, but I would never really just call them my friend. Doesn't mean they're my enemy because I don't call them my friend, but they're not in that category of somebody that I trust in and care for and go out of my way for and get excited to see, right? So, I mean, this is a really fundamental, basic type concept I want to help you understand. Maybe we need to take some people that are in the friend ledger and just put them back where they belong as an acquaintance. Maybe there's people that are as acquaintances that we need to really put them where they belong and they need to go over into the enemy side so that we know our enemy and we're prepared to deal with what's right. Genesis chapter 3, if you will, look at verse 15. This is God judging the serpent, uh, proclaiming His judgment on Lucifer. Verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The serpent tempted Eve. She sinned. Her husband came in and took the fruit also, and he chose to sin. She was beguiled and deceived. He knew what he was doing. He was guilty anyway. He followed his wife instead of following the Lord. Well, the devil had a part to play in this also. He's guilty. There was a judgment for him. He was demoted from being Lucifer, the light bearer, down to Satan, the adversary, the enemy. That's what his name means. He is the enemy. So don't tell me you don't have an enemy. It ought to be a no-brainer that uh, Satan is the enemy, right? Now, Satan's seed, it's what we could call the children of the devil, her seed, you could call it people, kind of, mankind. That's the woman's seed. Now, the children of the devil, the serpent seed, they are alive right now, and they are actively fighting against God, Christ, and Christianity. Romans 1, they hate God. They despise Him. They hate His Word. Even, they even hate the fake Christians. They hate all things God, good, light, and beautiful, and they're filled with the devil. They're alive. They've sealed, sealed their fate and seared their conscience, and these are people that cannot be trusted. Again, the woman's seed is mankind, but truly, truly it's the saints because we know later in New Testament prophecy as it helps us see things more clearly that truly the woman's seed is Christ as the Creator came down into flesh, God manifest in the flesh. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. And if you don't believe He's God, then you have the wrong Jesus. God has placed this spiritual warfare on the earth. If you would go to Psalm uh, 139, please. Go to Psalm 139. I want you to understand that there is an old you and there is a new you. There's the old man, there's the new man. God has placed this spiritual warfare inside of us. It's the flesh against the born-again spirit. That battle is here too because Satan knows how to use your flesh against you, the new man, the born-again Christian. You saint, you're eternal in the spirit, you're eternal in the soul, and he knows how to use your temporary flesh to hinder you. That's why Satan is the enemy. He's your adversary. He's against you, and he wants to use your body, your mind, your lust, your covetousness, your pride as distractions against yourself, 
You're, we're in opposition of our own selves. It talks about that elsewhere. Those that oppose themselves. And you guys, we've all met people like that. It's like, don't they see what they're doing to their own selves? And I mean, when you come across somebody that's hooked on meth or some drug, and it's like, they're literally ruining their lives and everybody around them that they used to love. And it's like, I wish you could see it from my eyes to see that you're hurting yourself and destroying yourself. Well, God gives us that ability through the Holy Spirit to look in the mirror and begin to discern through the Bible, it's called a mirror, the Word of God. It's a sword that can separate between the fleshly and the spiritual so we can identify our strengths and our weaknesses. Your flesh is an enemy in a sense, but uh, don't go and, you know, kill the enemy, okay? But deal with it. Control it. Understand it. I mean, if you don't know who your enemy is, then how can you fight the battle? If you don't know what your weakness is, how can you ever get strong? And again, don't tell me you have no enemies. I know. Blessed be the peacemakers. Amen. We ought to be peacemakers. Your enemy is whomever or whatever the devil can use against you to keep you from God. Very simply put. And again, maybe you are your own worst enemy at times. You're in Psalm 139. I want you to see this. This is from David. Verse 20. One, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? This is a strong statement. Hate is a word that's becoming outlawed, and uh, I am not advocating for blind hatred or violence to anybody. But we have to understand you don't love if you don't hate. We have to have the both. I mean, Jesus used the illustration of loving your family less, and yeah, he used the word hate for that in light of God. If you love your entertainment system better, my, my video games, I love my girlfriend more than God, well then you, in a sense, are hating God. Right? So you hate your parents according to your love for God. Your love for God ought to be magnified. We love Him because He first loved us. He loved us so much that He laid down His life for the sins of the world, and He's given us the gift of God, which is eternal life. It's totally free. All you have to do is believe it to receive it. You're born again. You're adopted into the family. The Holy Spirit moves inside of you, and now you can see different, and you can now begin to see the spiritual enemies that have been keeping you away from God. The problem is, many new Christians, they say, whoa, 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 this is too much. Take it off. I don't want to see all that. That hurts my eyes. <laughs> I want to help you see things God's way. Again, Psalm 139, verse 21. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God. And know my heart, try me, and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. It blows my mind that at this point he says, God, I hate the ones that you hate, and I hate them so perfectly. And God, would you try my heart and show me if I'm wrong? God, would you look in my soul and just tell me if I'm doing the wrong thing? I want to do the right thing. I know that you judge me. You know my thoughts. He says, try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Now think about it. There is a hatred that is not wicked in God's eyes. What's he say in uh, Jude 1, 22 and 23? Of some having compassion, making a difference. You love them to get them saved. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, right? Getting them out of hell, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. He's not saying hate a clothing line. He's not even saying uh, hate flesh or blood. He, what he's saying is hate the sin that's in the flesh so much because that is what's going to keep you from getting people saved. We're to, we're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ every day. We're to put on the armor of light. We're to put on and do this spiritual warfare. Instead, we put on the garments of flesh. What does that look like in the Spirit? 
Go to James chapter 4, please. It is interesting. He says there's some things you need to hate. And when you're right with God, He'll try your heart. He'll know your thoughts. And He'll make sure that your hatred is not wicked. Now, if you have wicked hatred, shame on you. If you hate somebody because they, they just don't like you, and you have an opportunity to witness to them by turning the other cheek, shame on you. If you hate somebody for the wrong reason, that's wicked and harmful and shameful. If you hate somebody because of the color of their skin, shame on you. If you hate somebody because of your own pride and you feel like you're better than them and you just want to get one up on them and you use that to justify your own sin in your heart, to always look at them and judge them and tear them down, shame on you. We're called to build each other up and lift each other up. We're called to love the lost enough to go and preach the gospel to them. In James chapter 4, if you will, look at verse number 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. What he's trying to tell you here is stop being intimate with worldly, secular things and get close to God. He says stop being intimate with the unsaved and get close to Christ. We fall in love with the things of this world, the pleasures of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That pride will destroy you. And God is trying to tell us something here. He's trying to say, listen, when you love all that stuff and just getting more stuff, and that's all you think about, God looks at you and says, this man has become my enemy. That's enmity with God. That's a big deal. How is it that when we get to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 3, he says there's going to be this war, this enmity. And we get back here in James near the end, and he's telling us what it is. We fall in love with the stuff, and we quit loving Christ like we ought to, and we get distracted, and the devil won in your life. This is a good verse for understanding separation, a Baptist, Baptist distinctive. This is a great verse for understanding sanctification, which is where you are set apart for a holy reason. We use the example. This pulpit is for preaching the Bible, teaching the Bible, having church, Sunday school. This pulpit, although it's just a piece of wood, it's an inanimate object. No, no, it's been set apart for a holy purpose to glorify God. God forbid anything ever come across this thing that would harm the name of Christ. Well, that's how we are in our life. Here we are as a living testimony, a living witness, a living temple for the Holy Spirit. And too many times we get distracted, we get caught up in the wrong battles. He calls them adulteresses and adulteresses, adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. If you are a liberal Christian and you're starting to look more like the unsaved world, you're walking on a path that will put you, what well, God would say, you're my enemy. Why are you going away from me? You know better. We, on the other hand, we're given the power of the Holy Spirit. What you say, we're supposed to shine more and more, right? We're supposed to get brighter and brighter until we see that day. So what do we do? Well, we share that light with others and we help them get saved and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, if you would. Let me give you a warning about making the wrong friends and a warning about making the wrong enemies. In 2 Chronicles 19.2, he says, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Now, that's quite an interesting statement. He says, you help the ungodly, now God's going to put wrath on you. Uh, let's not apply it out of context like we love to do. Oh, you help that guy change his tire and he's not even a Christian? Well, he's a Mormon and you help that guy? Oh, shame on you, God's going to get you. That's not what it means, right? <laughs> but as David failed for going to battle 
with Gath, the Philistines, against the Hebrews, his brethren, and believers in God, he was helping the ungodly, therefore wrath will come upon him. We're going to see it in just a minute. It brings up a question today that's so popular in the news and everywhere else. Well, are the Muslims your enemy? No, not necessarily. Are they your friends? No, can't really be that either. Guys, I have to share with you that the average Muslim and the average Christian are two totally different things than you'll ever see painted in the media. Let's say there's a guy that works at this uh, grocery store down the road here. Let's say he's Muslim. It may be true. I don't know. I haven't been in there, right? But let's just assume that it's owned by a Muslim guy, and he works in there, and he works 14 hours a day, and he's got a family, and he's trying to raise a family. And let's just assume that he's not one of these evil, like, God-hating suicide bomber types. Let's just assume that for a second. But everybody that he meets thinks he is, because that's what they saw on the news. Now, in his world and the media he watches, you come by and you leave him an invite to church or you say the name of Jesus, all of a sudden he's going to assume, oh, they must be a Roman Catholic. So they go in there where the guy puts on a dress and he burns incense in front of everybody. Weird, right? I mean, he may assume when you say, I'm a Christian, he doesn't understand the difference between biblical Christianity and the Roman Catholic pagan church. So there are spectrums within every religion, and maybe they're not all our enemy. But obviously that doesn't make them all our friends either. Maybe he's neutral. Maybe he's lost. And if you make him your enemy, you're keeping the opportunity to preach the gospel to him. The thing is, you know, <laughs> the Muslims, I want you to think about my statement earlier. Let's take a step back. Who is my enemy? Well, it's anybody or anything that would keep me from getting close to God. You know the TV is probably more your enemy than the Muslim down the road. You ever had a Muslim come and like block out the parking lot? You're not going to church! You ever had him break in your house and like steal your Bibles while you're not looking so you can't get close to God? You ever been persecuted as a Christian because you pray before your meal? You're sitting in a restaurant and you dare pray to the name of Jesus and thank Him for the food. You ever had a Muslim come up and smack you in the back of the head for it? <laughs> so, okay, so maybe they're not our enemies. Maybe they need saved also. Not condoning any of the wicked violence and wars. You have to understand that as well. So, are, so maybe we should politically support Israel. No. We can't scripturally support them either. No. It's important to understand. Romans 9, he says, they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. He says, but the children of the flesh, these are the children of God. I'm sorry, those that are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of the God. It's the children of the promise. He made a promise. That's the covenant. You believe on him. So it doesn't, in the Muslim world, if you're a Muslim, then they say, we're the children of God. In the Israeli world, they say, no, we're the children of God. Well, none of them have Jesus. They both have Jesus in their holy book, but neither one of them have the right Jesus, the Jesus that is God, that died for all of their sins, that rose again, that victoriously over the grave says, take the gift of God, which is eternal life, and God will dwell with you. No other religion teaches that the Holy Spirit of God comes and moves inside of you, and no other religion, as Jesus taught, says, don't go and shoot them and cut them up and convert them that way. We've been given the power of the Holy Spirit to convert both sides that are wrong, that are lost. And when we start picking sides to make enemies, sometimes we make the wrong enemies or the wrong friends. Romans 11, he said, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election have obtained it, and the rest were blind. The election obtained it, not Israel. Israel is not by default the elect. They're not all Israel. What's, your, what's he saying? It's just because of your zip code or your bloodline that doesn't make you right with God. If you don't have Christ, you're not right with God. Romans 11, he says, as concerning the gospel, he says, they are enemies for your sakes. Now, this is the hard one to swallow. In the Bible, it says that Israel is your enemy when it comes to the gospel. And I'm telling you, we're talking about choosing your enemy wisely. Knowing who your enemy is. 
Now, if you're traveling or you want to be a missionary, you want to go to Saudi Arabia, you better be careful because Saudi Arabia is your enemy for the gospel's sake. And if you go to Israel, then you better be careful because Israel is your enemy for the gospel's sake. Understand that, who it is. Now, if you meet one or the other tomorrow or both, don't be eager to make either one your enemy. But count them as neutral ground that we can try to plant the seeds of the Word of God and preach Christ and Him crucified unto them. And then maybe we can move them over to a friend category. We have to be careful with our political friendships and alliances that go against what God says. And I, Rome, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Mecca, those are spiritual, political entities that no Bible-believing Christian has any part of. And you, even patriotism. I'm a patriot. I love America, and I thank God for our freedom, and I th we know that it was started on people looking for religious freedom, and there's more religious oppression through the media and everything else today, specifically against biblical Christianity, and yet Jesus said, suffer. Turn the other cheek. You're in Ephesians 6. I want, to, I want you to see this. I want to help you identify your spiritual enemies. Look at verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You say, who's my enemy? Well, it could be that somebody down here in the mayor's office is your enemy, and somebody in the Masonic Lodge is your enemy, and somebody in Washington, D.C. is your enemy, and it could be that somebody in the Hollywood industry is your enemy because of spiritual reasons. But it still never tells you to go wrestle with flesh and blood. You know what an out-of-control Christian looks like? That's somebody that wants to wrestle with somebody else that they disagree with politically or spiritually. Oh, you're a Muslim, are you? I'm going to give you a black eye, buddy. I'll show you. Don't you know Jesus loves you? <laughs> I say all this to help us to understand very clearly. You have enemies. Some of them may not need to be enemies. Some of them may need to go back into that. They're just an acquaintance. And maybe you have some friends that Jesus says you shouldn't really have friendship with the world. Maybe they really shouldn't be your friend. Maybe they should go back into the acquaintance category because of the gospel. Go back to 1 Samuel, if you will, but this time go to verse 20, chapter 27. In Philippians 3, he says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. We're surrounded in this world by people that are enemies of the cross. And there are those that are the enemies of the gospel. And yet, this is not physical warfare. We don't go and bomb our enemies in the name of Christianity. That's hypocrisy. If you're born again and you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you have the power to overcome evil with good. But we need to identify who the enemy is. If you're on the field and it's foggy and you see a shape and you say, I don't know, good guy, bad guy, I'm just going to squint and pull the trigger. Shame on you! That's called friendly fire. There's a lot of that in the Christian camp, isn't there? Now look, when it comes to the gospel, I'm not afraid to name names and call them out that are preaching a false gospel of trusting in their own works to get to heaven. You have to repent of all your sins and turn it around and you got to be sorry for everything. No, it's called the gospel. It's good news. Know who the enemy is. And it's those that are opposed to the cross and the gospel. And there's many in the middle that because of their lifestyle... In the moment, you may have to put them in an enemy category. Sorry, I'm opposed to you. We are in opposition. We see things differently. I'm going to pray for you. I'm not wishing death on you. I'm not going to choke you out. But you know what? I have to separate because I'm a Christian, and you're on the other side of the spectrum right now, and I'm, you know, we're not mixing. I'm not interested in compromising and just destroying my life. 
David sinned against God. We're going to see it here. He sinned against his own conscience, and it was all because he had the wrong enemies. Now, at this point, I get to blame Saul. Why did David have the wrong enemies? Well, because his mentor, his leader, his king, his friend had the wrong enemies. Saul had the wrong enemies, didn't he? Verse 1, 1 Samuel 27. Verse 1, And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. Now there he goes, he's fearing the wrong thing. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines, and Saul shall despair of me to seek any more in the coast of Israel, so shall I escape out of his hand. What's his statement? I'm going to die. Saul's going to get me. I'll go to the bad guys, and I'll stay with the bad guys. And while I'm there... Saul will leave me alone. I don't know about that. Go to the next chapter, 28. Chapter 28, verse number 1. And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle. Thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee the keeper of mine head forever. You know what he's saying? You know what David's saying here when he says, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. He's boasting. He's bragging of his power and skill in warfare, isn't he? But he's doing it with the bad guy against the good guys. I mean, that's the kind of thing you would, a guy would pick up a rifle, yeah, I'll show you what I can do. You ready? I mean, don't we all do that in our own little skill set sometimes? I'm better than the best when it comes to this. Let me show you. That's what David was doing. Yeah, I'm a man of war. Check this out. You'll see what I can do. Go to the next chapter, chapter 29. This is where we started. Well, he goes to war with them. He gets in the camp. Then all the other Philistine kings are like, wait a minute. We know who that guy is. He's the one that's been killing us. Right? Now look at verse 3. Then said the princes of the Philistines, what do these Hebrews hear? And Achish said unto the princes of the Philistines, is not this David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, which hath been with me these days, or the years, and I have found no fault in him since he fell unto me into this day. And the princes of the Philistines were wroth with him, and the princes of the Philistines said unto him, Make this fellow return, that he may go again to his place which thou hast appointed him, and let him not go down to battle with us, lest in the battle he be an adversary to us. There it is, enemy. For wherewith should he reconcile himself unto his master? Should it not be with the heads of these men? Can you understand what he's saying? I, you, do you have any idea who you're talking about here? This is David, and he, we're going to get in the middle of the heat of the battle. Then all of a sudden he's going, that's my buddy, and oh, that's Captain so-and-so, and there's my brother over there. And hey, guys, I'm on your side. Receive me back. I'll start killing the bad guys. I mean, they're, they're like, no, this guy's our enemy. At least the enemy had it figured out that he was an enemy. But David hadn't quite figured it out yet. He was in the middle of making a huge mistake. Yeah. Is not this David of whom they sang one to another in the dances, saying, Saul slew his thousands and David his ten thousands? He had a reputation. Go to the next chapter, chapter 30. We were talking before the sermon. There was a couple folks in here and I, what are you preaching about? And I was talking about it a little bit and told them about Choose your enemies wisely. And in the conversation, some thoughts came up. I'll just share it, you know. Uh, who was Jesus' enemy? Well, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that the last enemy is death. But obviously, Jesus was fighting against Satan and, and the sin and the infection of sin. He was redeeming all the sin. You could say Satan was his enemy. In a sense, wasn't Judas his enemy? Did Jesus call Judas friend? Did Jesus treat Judas like a friend? Didn't he wash his feet the very night that he knew he would betray him to death? Now, what a great example. I'm not saying, you know, let people abuse you. But I am saying 
there's a certain amount of tolerance you can have to people trying to hurt you that you understand what's going on and you see the spiritual opportunity. And it's like, I see how you're treating me, but you know what, what Jesus would do? He'd wash your feet. Judas was an enemy. And Jesus still treated him respectfully and with love. You're in 1 Samuel 30. Let's finish this story here. Look at verse number 1. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who remembers the Amalekites? Who was supposed to kill the Amalekites? Saul. This is Saul's unfinished business. Isn't this why Saul lost the kingdom? For rebellion? He didn't do that. Oh, oh I've saved the best. I did it my way, God. Well, now here it is. Here's the Amalekites. While David's gone, they come in and attack Ziklag. The Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. Boy, you, you know what this is talking about? This is such a great army. Like they, they surround the whole city. They got the drop on them. The ladies and the children are there defenseless. They didn't have to kill anybody. It was like you surrender. You have no choice. There's a sword to your throat. They put the handcuffs on. Like, I mean, it was like they just captured all of them all at once. So David and his men, verse 3, came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever wept? I mean, I, I, I don't know if I've ever wept. I, I've wept over some stuff in my life. Can you imagine coming home and the place is burned and everybody you love, everything you've been building and working for is gone? This is nothing but the hand of Satan, my adversary. He's come to destroy me. It reminds me of the gentleman I was talking about in prayer time. I won't say his name, but you could see how distraught he was with what the devil has done to his family. And he was in tears. I want you to put yourself in this position for a minute. They lifted up their voice and wept. They had no more power to weep. David was so heartbroken that he's crying and crying and crying until he's got nothing left. I mean, he is hitting rock bottom. There, there, he is just so, like, everything is gone. I can't believe it. God is judging me. I mean, they're probably having a Job moment right here. You're sitting in the ashes, the burnt ashes of your friends, right? Well, he didn't know it. Nobody was dead, but they see that everybody's gone. And David's two wives were taken captive. Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed. You know, it takes, it takes a, a, a man of God to really have fear for their family. We live in a time where some people say, yeah, well, if they're going to do that to me, who cares? I'm just... <laughs> Sister Sylvia was talking about earlier about somebody else, about how much they loved their second wife. And what, what did she say? Uh, if only he had just loved his first wife. <laughs> we live in a time where that's not very popular to love your family. God gave us a family. One of the first commandments, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. And we've got to have a family. This is a godly principle. It takes the Holy Spirit to be selfless and love them more than you. And sometimes we have to kind of retrain our flesh and get back on focus and remember what matters. And here David's like, yeah, I'll go fight against the Hebrews. Let's go. He leaves his family behind and God says, no, sir. That's your family too. You've made an enemy out of a friend. Now you're going to go, uh, wh what's he say? P re put forth your hand against the Lord's anointed. If you guys remember, we saw it in 1 Samuel 26 and also 24. Five times, five times it came out of David's mouth. I'm not going to touch Saul. God anointed him to be king. This is after David was already anointed to be the next king. He says, I'm not going to kill the king. 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 And finally he's like, yeah, I'll go with you guys. I'll show you what I can do. I get him. Something changed. He made the wrong enemies. 
I'm here to tell you, you have enemies. And you need to choose your enemies wisely. David failed, and now he's hitting rock bottom. This is where the story gets real gritty. It's all burnt. Everybody's gone. We've cried until we can cry no more. We're so distressed. It says David was greatly distressed. Look at it in verse 6. David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Now it's like, David, we're following you and you lost our family and everything. We ought to kill you to get revenge. I mean, they're mad now. Now that they're done crying, they still got all those emotions balled up and they don't have their family back. They're ready to kill David for being a poor leader, for making the wrong enemies, picking the wrong fight in the wrong battle. He says that they were ready to, to uh, the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. I want you to know right here, these are probably some of the most powerful words in the entire Bible. I can't tell you how many times in my life these words have come back to me. What did David say? I don't know. How exactly did he do it? I don't know. It's not about a technical process. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He came to a point where he's lost it all and he's heartbroken. He feels worthless and hopeless. His best friend friends are ready to kill him and all he's got left is God and he breaks down and he gets alone and he cries out to the Lord and he says, Lord, I've got nothing but I've got you. Lord, even though this is a terrible thing, I know that you're, you're, you, I'm still alive. You must have a plan in it. How do, you, how do you, when you're so broken and hurting and distressed and distraught and tired and wore out, how do you encourage yourself in the Lord your God. It's not just patting yourself on the back and lying to yourself. It's not looking in the mirror and saying, you're the man, you can do anything. No, no, no. It's getting by yourself privately and talking to the Lord and pouring out your heart, confessing your faults and saying, God, I need your help. You alone can help me in this situation. These are, I believe, perhaps the most powerful words in the whole Bible. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. If you will remember those words, not the rest of the sermon about the enemies, but if you will remember those words, they will help you out in your life. I promise you that. I can't tell you what prayer to pray when you need it. I can't tell you what words to say, where to get, what verse to read. But I tell you this, you come to the throne of grace with boldness, boldly proclaiming that there is hope in the Lord when you need it the most. God has given us His Holy Spirit. David made the wrong enemies and it hurt everybody he loved. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Verse 7, And David said to Abithar the priest, Ahimelech's son, remember Ahimelech that died because of David, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abithar brought the, the ephod to David. I want you to understand the ephod was kind of like a robe. It was a priestly garment. It's not like they set it up like an idol, like here it is, now we can pray. No, no. What he was trying to say, the abithar was some, or I'm sorry, the, 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 the ephod was something you had to separate yourself and sanctify yourself to put on. It was a symbol of, hey guys, now we're going to have church. This was a public proclamation. This was at the center of the temple. If you remember, this is the same ephod when David went there, uh, Ahimelech. He said, you have any sword here? He's got, I've got Goliath's sword. It's back there behind the ephod. Then Doeg, the Edomite, slays, what was it, 80 guys, kills all the people that wore the ephod, it said. And his son was the only one that escaped, and here he came with an ephod in his hand. He didn't come with a weapon running to David. He came with a garment that was used in priestly service of having a public time of worshiping the Lord. The next thing David did after he got his mind right with the Lord, he said, we all need to draw nigh unto the Lord. He says, get ready, we're having church, right? Can you imagine? Get your britches on, we're going to the church, right? He says, get the, get the ephod, it's time. Time to sanctify, time to search the Lord. Look at verse 8. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue? And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? 
Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. This is an awesome proclamation from the Lord. He's beginning to get things right. Now listen, guys, I believe David hit rock bottom, and now he's bouncing back up. And with the power of the Lord, it tells us literally the words Brother Chad said, oh, uh, chapter 30, he says, the words, I remember, he recovered all. Didn't it say he recovered all? God promised it right here in verse 8. It tells us that same thing twice. It says it in verse 18, and David recovered all. It says it in verse 19 at the end, uh, David recovered all. It says at the end of verse 20, this is David's spoil. So he goes in, he kills them, he slays them. God goes in with him. They do this miraculous thing that Saul couldn't do. They wipe out the Amalekites, just a few men with some fire and for the Lord. They say, God's going to give it to us. I don't care how many there are. God's going to help us win. He's done it before. Let's go and do it. Come on. And so they went, they did, and they, uh, he says, they pursued, they overtake, and they recovered all. That was God's promise, and they got it. But then, in verse 22, we see some bad friends, or really their enemies. Look at verse 22. Then answered all the wicked men and the men of Belial, those are Satan worshipers, sons of the devil, the men of Belial, of those that went with David and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Do you understand what these guys are saying? Like, hey, we were with David. Now it says they're sons of Belial. That means they're not saved. They're reprobates. They're rejects. They're devil worshipers, literally, of Belial. But yet they were in David's camp. And they went to war. They came back with their stuff, everybody else's stuff, and all the other stuff that the Amalekites had taken from everybody else. So they had a great spoil of things. And he says, those guys that were weary that couldn't go with us to the battle, don't let them in. In fact, just give them their family back. And then tell them, take your family out of here and you depart, you get out of here. That's not very nice. <laughs> Look at David's response. Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us. Who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us in our hand? For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as for his part that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. He says, God has this huge reward, and He gave it to us. It's all for God, and you split it evenly. You part it up evenly. Well, they weren't there. They were watching your stuff, and they were part of the thing. You give them an even share. Verse 25, And it was so from that day forward that He made a statute and an ordinance in Israel unto this day. And when David came to Ziklag, he sent of the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. I'll stop there for tonight. He goes on and gives a list of people that he shared things with, even down to the part, all the places they were hiding when they were running from Saul. He's like, remember when I was hiding out in your woods, I'm sending you some stuff. I'm sending you some spoil, sending you some cattle and some gold. David figured out that he had the wrong friends. He hit rock bottom and he turned it around and he started making the right friends. We've probably heard the majority of our life to choose our friends wisely. But I just want to give you this thought also in the Bible. It's teaching us to choose your enemies wisely. This was David's final test before his kingship. And he failed. And every time you fail, you better figure out what you're supposed to learn. There was a, a meme an image with words on it. I, I think I've shared it on the YouTube channel, but it says in, in, uh, in life, I think is how it says it, you, you, get the, you get the lesson and then you get the test. But in Christian life, you get the test and then you get the lesson, right? <laughs> David got the test. He failed. He learned the lesson. Be careful who you make your enemy. Don't let it be your brethren. Be careful who you make your friend. Don't let it be the sons of Belial. 
This is something that I think if all Christians would choose wisely, there are times that God's going to put us through a trial so that we can learn who our friends and our enemies are. And moving forward, I would encourage you, choose your enemies wisely based on are they keeping you from getting close to God? That's the easy answer. If anybody saved, lost, or a son of the devil is trying to keep me from getting close to God, then that makes them my enemy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love You so much, and Lord, we love Your Word. I pray that You would help this concept to stick with us. And remember to be very careful who we're against and who we're for. But Lord, I pray that this, this idea of encouraging ourselves in the Lord, Lord, I see it as a promise. I see it as a guarantee. Lord, I know that it's true and I've used it many times in my life. And I just pray that you would help all of us to remember that you have the power to submit and call on the Lord. And he will encourage you if you ask him. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be a good example of Christians. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.